Hello folks, welcome back to the plot. Bag full of stuff today, always exciting. I'll show you what, what's in there in a moment, but I have to say, April is doing me dirty. Beautiful day, again, it's happened again. <laughs> Lovely weather when I left the house. And it's on the turn, it's on the turn. It's so unpredictable, April. No matter what the forecast is, but I have finally learned my lesson and I've brought a coat today. But absolutely loads and loads I wanna do today. And it feels like I've just caught the bug at the moment. I was down here yesterday after work, I'm up here again after work. It's something about the light evenings, actually having time and not feeling like you're completely up against the clock and in a massive rush. So like I say, massive to-do list, I'm just gonna get stuck straight into it. But first, we're gonna talk about dibbing and the dibbing debate, the can of worms that I opened up. <laughs> there were a few people who said, I know exactly what you mean, JB, I've been wondering the same thing. But for the most part, people just said things like, JB, if you want something the shape of your sea tray, just put your dibber in the ground and then wiggle it around a bit. And it doesn't work in my soil. I think that's what I think that's what it is. What it is, I think, is because I'm on quite heavy clay. I think most of the people in the comments maybe aren't. Let me show you what I mean. Now, before I show you what I mean, actually, I do just want to start by saying I love all of my commenters very, very dearly. I really genuinely appreciate it. 99% of the comments, it's just people trying to be helpful. When you say things like, can't you just wiggle the dibber around? <laughs> Sounds a bit pretty, doesn't it? Um, I, get what, I get what you're saying. It's a helpful comment. It does make sense. But I thought it would just be good to take a minute and show you why. This is not raised bed gardening, you know? So the first comment I got was, um, just use your hand. You know, like what I just use my hand when I want to make a, a planting hole. And I can do that in the back garden where we filled the raised beds with like nice fluffy compost. Clay soil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting literally my entire weight. I could like scrape it back a little bit, but I mean, I've got a stone here. Let's just get that first. And I could scrape. And there we go. <laughs> That's kind of what I wanted to show you. That's what happens with this soil. So as you're going in, you'll end up with a whole thing just giving way. And now I've got all this. <laughs> I'm trying to plant an onion, not a courgette. Look at this. <laughs> See, it just doesn't work. Uh, and not only now do we have a hole, like I say, I've got to have something else to fill in with compost or um, that kind of thing. But um, that was a heck of a lot of work. It wasn't very fun. And the other thing was, um, People just saying, wiggle the dib around. But the same thing happens. So I can go around like that, which is what I showed in the video, but that doesn't actually make the hole any bigger, really. It just makes it slightly wider at the top here. And all of this stuff at the top just falls into it. So now the hole has instantly disappeared. So if I wiggle it round, it's exactly the same thing. You just get um, a big cone shape now with loads of gaps. And what I think a lot of people meant is, why not put it in and then push it out to the side? or something like that. <laughs> Look at the explosions you get. It's not soft, fluffy soil. Look at the absolute state of it. Can you imagine trying to get these in like a nice neat row that you could then come through and weed properly with a hoe? <laughs> it's just, it's not gonna happen, is it? The other one does make a lot of sense, a uh, bulb planter. I do use bulb planters and I love this one in particular. It's one of these, I think it's Gardena, I don't actually know, but it's got a lovely little handle. So perfect action, although clay does get stuck, so you've got to do a bit of tap tap. I love this thing. I use it all the time for slightly bigger things like a courgette or a cucumber, something that generally I, I start the seed in a pot. <laughs> Relatively easy, yes, but I'm sure you can see the problem here. There is a, a chasm <laughs> around, the, around the seedling, and I did have someone say, just do a slightly bigger hole with your dibber or whatever, and then water it in. But once again, I'm fairly sure because of the clay, it won't just, you know, it won't just fill this in. Like I say, if this was a nice compost based raised bed, if you watered this, it would all kind of mobilize and find its level. Let me, let me try it. There is a good chance I'm wrong on this one. Looks like it might have mobilized a bit, but um, no. <laughs> I think I've now got a moat. <laughs> Look at this, the onion moat. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
not like I'm I'm painfully aware that this is proper nitpicking, right? But I was just thinking about it just now, and I, I would like to imagine myself gardening for the rest of my life, okay? And I quite like the idea of sorting this problem out now, because it might save me hours and hours over the next 20 years. And I did have a few very kind people reach out with offers of free 3D printing. Um, and one of the viewers, Alex, is really experienced with 3D printing and has done loads of his own stuff based on container-wise modules before because he's had the same problem. So hopefully on the channel in the near, not too distant future, you'll see me trying that out. But the, I did have one more technique. We're still talking about this. Yes, one more technique, which was, um, and I thought this was quite interesting, something I'd never really thought about. But a lot of people saying they don't like dibbing because it compacts the soil. And I actually think you might have a, quite a good point, especially if, like me, you're on very heavy clay. And I wonder if, you know, for, for the longest time, I've not had the best crops when I put them out. And I do wonder if maybe, maybe it's an compaction that's actually not great. But for now, I do still like the idea of dibbing out. Um, and with something this small and quite well established, I think the roots are gonna get away. Um, no problem. But yes, the other method that people said using a trowel is probably best if you want to avoid compaction. But for me, going down, basically getting on my hands and knees for every little transplant of an onion, it's just a little bit extra. It's going to take the joy out of it for me. <laughs> I know this is, this is nitpicking to the, to the nth degree. And if I wanted to save time, there's probably a hundred other ways that I could save time, but it's just one of those things that I want to fix. And I thought you might appreciate me showing you in the soil exactly what I'm talking about. And I would again, just like to reiterate my very genuine thanks for all the lovely and supportive and helpful comments I get. Let's look what's in the back. I did get possibly funniest comment I've ever had on my last video. <laughs> it's comment in the history of the channel. Someone said, Folks, I, what was it they said? I think it was like, guys, this guy has a full-time job and a massive allotment, and he never shows us what he's doing. There's more than meets the eye going on here. <laughs> Implying that I've got hired help. <laughs> Have you seen my allotment? If I had hired help and it looked like this, they wouldn't be in the job. <laughs> they would not be in the job. But maybe one of the, the nicest backhanded compliments I've ever had. Right, let me show you these. Actually, I need to get these out of the greenhouse quickly. Oh God, they're all caught up. Let me put these outside quickly. Get out, get out. So they are the meadow plug plants that I was talking about recently that I want to put under the orchard, but they are, I think, covered in aphids. I'm assuming they're covered in aphids because they've been in my conservatory at home where we do have a bit of an aphid problem. I don't want them to get in here and explode. But yes, we have that. We have a coat because I am now better prepared. Mainly, <sighs> netting, new netting. Now, I've got two kinds. This stuff, the butterfly netting for the brassicas, because I'm so excited to have two separate brassica beds this year with a path down the middle, and I needed a second set. This is from Harrod Horticultural, if you're interested. I have bought this with my own money. Full disclosure, they did send me some for free last year, and to be honest, I fell in love with this stuff. It's not cheap. Um, I'll leave a link in the description, and my, once again, full disclosure, that will be affiliated, so I'll get a few pennies if you do buy it. But this stuff, it's quite small. I think this is the same gauge as the Yes, so it's perfect for butterflies. It will still let things like carrot fly or something like that in. It's not like EnviroMesh. But this stuff is so strong compared to the cheap green stuff that you can get. Like I say, it's a little bit dear. It's got this really nice dense edge, like the stitching on the edge is dense. I've only used this for one year on my brassicas last year, but not a single rip or tear. And you know, pretty neglectful guy, as, as I say. If I had staff, they'd be getting sacked. <laughs> Well, one thing I always had, especially before the beds, is um, around the edge of the netting, the grass starts to grow up into the netting. And what I've always experienced with the cheap netting is as you start to try and pull it apart, get the grass out and do the bit of weeding, that's when you start the netting just starts falling apart and you end up with all these holes that all the, uh, the butterflies can get in. This stuff, like Fort Knox for butterflies, I'm convinced. So I'm very, very excited to get that on the bed. And I must say as well, I say I bought it with my own money. I bought it with the patrons' money. Thank you ever so much, as always, to all of my patrons who do make my gardening life so much easier. In fact, you know, if I've got someone in the comments saying I've got staff, I do have some help, and it is the patrons. So I'm not completely on my own, but the other one is this. And I must say, once again, Harrod Horticultural, but 
<laughs> I think this is about 20 quid. <laughs> when I opened the packet and it was this, I was like, hang on a minute, what's going on here? This is the P-netting um, for the scaffolding P-frame, and it's just much less material, you know, compared to that brassica netting. So um, I think it's a fair price, it's just super thick. Um, let me open it up and have a little look. Oh, it's very... <laughs> it's a bit weird. <laughs> I don't know why, it's kind of disconcerting. So this is two, two meters by five meters, which I think is gonna be enough for kind of two meters tall, 2.5 wide, that should do my beds. I should do one of my beds with two sets of, of kind of peas going up. Um, I don't really, why is it so thin? Oh, is that gonna be, oh, what? That can't be two meters wide, can it? Oh, maybe, maybe when you stretch it out, maybe it does. Let's go and have a, let's go and have a look on the frame. I must admit, I didn't get too far with this frame yesterday, but I did get a couple of clamps on the top, which are now ready for me to put this cross beam in and build the frame up. But I did have um, another comment as well saying, it's, it might be fast JB, but it's worth putting these diagonal braces in because once you've got your peas on here, you do not want to have a storm, come and blow them all over. Because if the poles go, everything will go. Now I have no idea how, <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I being really stupid? I think I must be being stupid, right? Is it? <laughs> One of those things I regret starting to film. I'm just, I'm simply trying to understand the dimensions because is that, maybe stick your foot in it. <laughs> it just doesn't look like it could be two meters to me. Okay, no, there you go. Oh, there's like, okay. Yes, that's gonna work, isn't it? There's enough there. I just, it went to kind of one point instead of two point. <laughs> we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out. It looks fine, that's my point. Mostly I was just worried that I'd bought the wrong thing. So a lot of faffing, not a lot of doing already. Gonna chuck this back in the greenhouse and then I'm gonna plant out. Oh, can you see me, we've gone dark. This bay tree is getting bigger and bigger and casting more and more shade. The first plot now that we're on this one, pretty much. I think that tree must be a good two, maybe two and a half hours of shade. One of the reasons I wanted to put some of the brassicas, these are gonna be the two brassica beds this year, and I think they might do a little bit better, you know, with, with a bit of shade compared to a lot of other crops. Let's get those meadow plug plants in, and I'm gonna use a bulb planter for that. Quick post-mortem on the moat. Speaking of bulb planters, it's watered in, look at that gap. Look at that gap, uh -uh, doesn't work. So it's just over here in the orchard and my thinking is, my hoping is, that these are going to set seed and then just naturalize and kind of establish in here. The original plan, I've had a few questions over the, the last few months about this little meadow area under the orchard. I did start a making a meadow series and the idea was I wanted to mainly establish yellow rattle in this grassland sward and get that going and then naturally I was hoping a load of um, just natural kind of wildflowers or maybe weed seeds in the seed bank would pop up or blow in. It's just not really worked. The yellow rattle never established. I did two years of plug plants, I've done seed sowing. It's just not worked for whatever reason. What is still working is mowing this, cutting and collecting, so reducing some of the nutrient level in that soil, slowing down the grass a little bit and I think just supplementing that with a few of these kind of plants maybe a few seeds, maybe a few things that I'm gonna grow over the years. And eventually, hopefully, this will start to naturalize a little bit more. We've got the bulbs in now. It's starting to look really nice. And this will just give it a little bit of a push. The plants that we've got here are, oh, these are very light. <laughs> oh dear me, okay. These have been in the conservatory and they are in dire need of water. Feels like a lot of coir, cocoa coir in that. But um, yes, the three plants, we've got uh, bladder campion, the Deptford Pink and the Lesser Knapweed. And actually, well, <laughs> I said the bulb planter is good for this kind of thing. This is a good example of my soil. And you can just hear this kind of stones that it's grinding on there. This has never been cultivated, so actually the bulb planter, I don't think is gonna cut it. And this soil is bigger than the bulb planter, so I'd have to do a few anyway. So this is a job for the trowel. I can't really call a trowel an underrated tool, but um, maybe slightly overlooked. It is great. I know people talk about the Hori Hori a lot. I do own one, but I don't use it on the allotment because of this exact issue. The stones and the clay, it just doesn't like it. You blunt the blades. Um, 
So the Hori Hori only really gets used at home in the nice raised beds. And like I say, I'm not opposed to, to using a trowel and doing a bit of stuff like this when you've got a nice established plant like this. But when you've got 50 onions that you want to put out, I don't want to do this for everyone. I must say that of all the decisions I've made on this allotment, I think actually having this little meadow and this little orchard area is probably one of my favourites. I spend just quite a lot of little bits of time between doing jobs, just enjoying things like watching the bees here. And I do like the idea of, you know, just having a few more flowers, having the spring bulbs this year and the cowslips back here. It just really helped me appreciate it. And I can hear the bees already doing their thing, absolutely going crazy in the cherry blossom. There's one just here. It's interesting, there are pretty much always bumblebees at the start and then in a little while the honeybees will start to arrive. Anyway, I made a to-do list today, so let's go and see what is on the phone. <laughs> I've been very scattered in the last few videos, just going left, going right, seeing things. Oh, let's do that, let's do this. <laughs> there are a few things I do need to do today. See the broad beans back there, I want to get those out today as well. I'm really failing it at the moment. I'm just like, yes, yes, this is my happy place. I'm really, really enjoying it. So the dibbing debate, we've done that. The silver grow debate, we haven't done that, let's do that. So I did mention in a video a little while back in the polytunnel, I was talking about some of the different needs for silver grow, especially a little bit of an early feed. I had a lot of mixed feedback on silver grow. Obviously I've been doing a lot of content on silver grow. I used silver grow, we went to the factory and I've been talking a lot about some spotty germination this year and I keep getting people saying, what if it's your silver grow? And I don't think it is. And the primary reason for that is that it's very, if you do have bad germination, it's pretty generally speaking, unlikely to be your compost. You don't need much to get a seed germinated. You can do it in a wet paper towel. They just need moisture, a bit of light. Some seeds like basil down here, this one needs a bit of light. So you wanna do it slightly closer to the surface or on the surface. But generally speaking, so long as they're moist, the, the, jo the job will be done. And although I've had spotty germination, you can see loads of stuff is germinating just fine. It tends to be specific seeds that I'm having the issue on. So for example, these nasturtium, really good. These lettuce, the red bowl lettuce, really good. The saladin lettuce, really good, all came up. Where there's a problem, like my spring onions, generally, this is an entire tray of spring onions. So it's a bit patchy on the spring onions. Up here, all my aubergines, they've come up just fine. Um, my chilies are a bit slow, they will just need it hotter. I know that the cowslips, probably old seed, Tim's Taste of Paradise, my tomatoes have just been a bit slow. Down here, the sweet peas, all germinated in silver grow perfectly fine. I've got some sunflowers back there, all three of those pots germinated perfectly fine. We've got a little gourmet salad mix, pretty good germination on that. I had nearly 100% success rate germinating my chilies just in silver grow. There's all, there's all the seedlings that Jess has done, the flowers at home, they've all been in silver grow. So I am very open to the idea of me being a bit biased or like kind of, you know, hitching my horse to the cart, is that a thing? Um, but you know, I've never received a penny from silver grow. They've never given me anything. I do just generally think it's a very good product and it's worked really well for me and a lot of other people I know. I know Tony's had a bit of a funny start, we were talking about that on Potty, but um, yeah, I just thought that would be worth mentioning, silver grow and germination. <laughs> Next on the list, there's a few things that I just forgot to show you. My yesterday video was just, I was just trying to show you a few things. Two things I completely forgot to show you. And the first is so friggin' exciting. It's in here, I've got it in here nice and moist because this doesn't like to dry out apparently. This arrived just the other day, looking spectacularly creepy. I don't know if you can see, but this is a set of asparagus crowns. I'm finally gonna plant some asparagus on the plot. That is so long overdue. I've been wanting asparagus for the longest time. It is one of my favorites, but I've just never, it takes up quite a lot of space. And you know, until I had that second plot, the plot extension, I've always been a little bit tight and I thought, mm, asparagus probably gonna take up a little bit much. Oh, the other thing, <laughs> they're going, what was I saying just now? I've been going left, right, getting distracted. This is why I wrote the list. I wanted to show you this, which is just a bit of gossip, really. A little bit gossipy, but something I saw and I thought, oh God. And it's the plot next door. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but in summer, this was just head high grass. Bit of a shame, just completely overgrown. There was a greenhouse over here that was just completely fallen down. Someone's had a nice little scaffolding idea over there. But what I wanted to show you is the bindweed. I just wrote a note in my phone and I called this the bindweed plot. 
And I had noticed that there was a bit in here, but oh my goodness, once you get your eye in, it is absolutely everywhere. Can you see that big tuft there? And um, it's, it's getting me a bit nervous. I don't know if you can see on that bed over there, but it's just like just above the grass, everything that's peeking out is bindweed, little tips of bindweed. It is on everything on here, absolutely everything. I've never seen bindweed like it. And can you see why I'm nervous? Plot next door, path, my plot, my beds. <laughs> I have noticed the bindweed is in the path. Not as much as you might expect though, but I have always been very careful. I don't really mow this because I'm a bit terrified about getting a load of bindweed roots in my mower chopped up and then putting that in the slow compost, probably be all right in the hot composter, but yeah, I've always been a bit mindful, but I could, I was just like, oh my good. When I saw it, I've never seen a plot like it. I mean, you've all seen the pictures of my plot when I first took it on, it was bad and there was bindweed and there still is bindweed, but it wasn't like this. <laughs> it was just unbelievable. So um, I, just, I just had to show you. And I thought it might be a little bit nice as well to think if you've taken on a bit of a nightmare plot recently, Hopefully, didn't have as much bindweed as this at least. <laughs> There's always a silver lining, folks. Now I said there was loads on the to-do list and what I, what I really meant is I wrote lots of very little things, so we've done most of them, but... Um, oh, one other thing, there was, <laughs> one other thing. I did show off this chili pepper and I showed some sun damage and there was a really interesting discussion on the Potty Mouth Discord about whether or not it might be spider mite damage. And I did see a little web. You won't be able to see this on camera, but there is some webbing on here and I saw it and I went, oh no, because if you remember, I had really bad spider mite issues last year in the other greenhouse and the webbing is actually just a normal spider web. It's a tiny little spider, but it's not a spider mite. It's just a spider. But I'd spent quite a lot of time. I did some macro photography on this and I can't see any signs of spider mite and I do think I'm fairly happy saying that this is probably sun damage although I am a little bit nervous now and I'm going to be watching this very closely because spider mites are really quite destructive they're not like aphids you know aphids quite often you'll see aphids on your plants and they're they're gonna get eaten by other stuff you know they might do a little bit of damage to your plants but generally it's gonna be fine Spider mites are a lot more aggressive and once they take hold and really start to explode, there's not that much which predates them. You know, like aphids have got loads of stuff like lace wings and ladybirds and hoverfly larvae which will readily gobble them up and kind of keep their population in check. But as I understand it, you know, spider mites do have natural predators and you can, you can buy some as well. But um, generally speaking, it's, it's really easy for them, especially because you're you're going to get them undercover in greenhouses most often or in polytunnels where it might be a bit harder to get those predators coming in then uh, they can really get out of control and last year my, um, my cucumbers in the greenhouse completely kaput but I am going to do a bit of sowing because it's mid-April now I think I can probably get away with doing a few courgettes and uh, what's the other thing? Cucumbers, the other C. Courgettes and cucumbers. And the potting mix I'm using, uh, I just use straight silver grow. I don't tend to sieve it unless it's something really, really fine, but I do add a little bit of, I would usually add blood fish and bone, which is a bit more organic. This stuff is pelleted fertilizer. It was really cheap. I got it so cheap on a discount and couldn't refuse it. It was like a clearance sale. It was literally 50p a bag. Um, so I use a bit of this, but you, you know, blood, fish and bone is just as good. And if it's something that's going to be in the pot for a little while, I'd like to use a little bit of this mycorrhizal fungi, which should be in the soil, just plenty. But when you're growing in pots, you can just inoculate the soil a little bit with this stuff. No real measurement, just a few pinches, you know. A little bit goes a long way. This is a very large tub. So the methodology this year, um, I'm gonna be doing something ever so slightly different, bringing out the big guns. I love these 15 cell trays. They are absolutely colossal. These things are actually bigger than the small pots that I use. You get more soil 
Well, maybe it's about the same actually, but these are just really nice, really ergonomic, and I'm gonna be doing my courgettes and my cucumbers in here, and from this, they will go straight out side into the ground or into a pot for the polytunnel or something like that. Now, I'll just quickly wrap through the varieties. I like doing this because it reminds me myself if I lose any labels. The cucumbers, starting with the classic market more. I love doing that one outdoors. The Merlin cucumber, I think I tried that last year and it didn't do too well. You can see this is a slightly faded packet. So with something like this that's a bit older, I'll do two or three seeds in each one of those cells. The Honey Plus I had great success with last year. I had a few too many, to be honest. They're more of a, they're not like the mainstay cucumber. You don't want those with every single meal, but they are quite nice. Um, this one I think might be a bit similar, but this one is the Crystal Lemon, which I've seen loads of people grow on, on YouTube for absolutely ages. And then the Courgettes, the Butter Stick, a small yellow, the Courgette All Green Bush. These are really old. This, <laughs> this is so by 2021, so that might not come. And in that case, I hadn't seen that it was that old, to be honest. I've got this, which just says courgette from Thompson & Morgan. No variety name or anything, just courgette. Uh, so by May 2023. Do you see why I, th I think I might have some germination issues this year? Because this is what I do. I don't really throw away the seeds, and um, some of them are a little long in the tooth. We've got those courgettes, and this one sent to me by Jesse, the Bianca di Trieste. Absolutely beautiful little chap from the market in Amalfi, where she got loads of her seeds. Pick them at 10 centimeters long, otherwise they go hollow and gross. She wrote loads of little tips on those seeds, really, really nice. Um, and a little bit outside the box, but I'm gonna sow some tomatoes in these massive fat modules as well, which I've never done before, but I don't see why it wouldn't work, and I've got the space, so I think it makes sense to use it. These are the other ones that Jesse sent me. The goat bag, amazing. Uh, the start relays and the green doctor. It is quite difficult to show you properly, but I just wanted to mention I am loving this setup so much. It makes sewing so much easier. I've got all my amendments just down there. There's a few little, little space for growing and just a sort of dumping for tools that should get put away at the end of each day. But having all the seed trays just under here, it's so easily to access the compost just here, the seed boxes, the plant labels in a little container, a little space to even write the plant labels, just everything finally has a place in the greenhouse. And it's just one of those little things that, you know, once you, once you get it there and everything stays there and you just know where everything is, oh, it's like gardening on easy mode. You know, I feel like I'm cheating. It's so, so good. It's just, I really just, you know, adore this, this rebuilt greenhouse. It's. Oh, it's so good. I had no idea I was going to enjoy it this much because I don't think I was planning on spl splashing out on the staging. I really just wanted to fix the base, but I'm so glad I treated myself to this stuff. It's <laughs> made the world a difference. I feel so relaxed doing this. I say it's gardening on easy, easy mode. It is until everything <laughs> refused to germinate. And then you realize it's because your sowing seeds are like three years out of date. Ah, still learning. Continuing the great Dibba debate <laughs> of 2024. Claire from um, the Farmyard Garden. I think that's what she's just renamed it to. It's just sent me a really funny Instagram reel of someone using a, um, like a wedge, you know, like a shoe. Not like a high heel, but like, <laughs> like that. <laughs> to plant onions and it's a perfect shape. I should have used that all along, but, oh, I love these big trays. There's something about these big trays really, really substantial. And I, you know, I never would have ever thought to actually buy these. Um, but Steve used them all the time. I mostly use them for broad beans, but later in the year, it's really good for these slightly chunkier stuff that you don't really want to bother with potting on. Just stick them in something a bit chunky and then get them out in the ground. Really, really pleased with those two. I'm not sure if getting more tomatoes on the go is <laughs> most sensible thing in the world. We do have quite a lot, but then again, it is looking like the spotty germination. I'm not 100% not sure whether all of these are gonna come through or not, although this tray is looking much better. You know, I actually think, now I'm looking at it. Oh, this tray is looking really good. We've got much more germination, only one. There's only three cells actually out of all of these that are missing now. And these Roma, which is all one variety. I do wonder if this one getting completely flooded because it was under the window is what had set this back. And maybe, maybe there's a chance some of those have rotted. So having a few more tomatoes, well, what's the harm? What's the harm? What could go wrong? <laughs> Nothing. It's, oh, it's just 
just, you know, I, f I feel like I've still got a lot of space in the greenhouses actually, so sowing more and more, it just feels like the right thing to do. Oh, it's a gorgeous evening. Next up for me, I think I'm gonna get these broad beans out because, oh, just look at that sky. Look at that sky, gorgeous. Yeah, these broad beans definitely, I think, just getting a little bit long in the tooth. Um, so I think, <laughs> well, just put a line in here. <laughs> Try and hide these letters. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people will focus on the broad beans instead. I've only done a few this year. I like, you know, broad beans, they're okay, but they're not like my favorite. I wouldn't like to have too many of these. I like to have just a few to use here and there. Um, I know a lot of people, I mean, I've, I saw on a, one of my neighbor's plots, they've actually got like almost two full beds just for broad beans. And like, they are great because you can grow them early. But I do wonder if quite a lot of people um, grow broad beans just because they grow quite quite nicely and you can get them in quite early. But um, I wouldn't like to have to process or, or <laughs> find recipes or ways to eat them all, to be honest. Now you will know I'm going back to the bulb planter for this one. And like I say, I'm not, I'm not opposed to doing a bit of this. It's just, I do quite like trying to where I can making sure that gardening doesn't feel like a chore. For me, there's, there's not that many things. Oh, they look good. They look really good. That actually feel like a chore. There's lots of things I enjoy that other people don't. I quite enjoy weeding, especially hand weeding. Um, most people, I think, would think I'm a little bit crazy for saying that. But if someone says that they're trying to cut down on, on weeding and they're looking at new techniques, then that just kind of makes sense to me. And for me, planting out onions, apparently one of those things and uh, anything else from those little cells. With the beds this year, um, I'm doing what I normally do, which is just leaving a little bit around the outside for flowers, basically. Um, I've done a lot more flowers this year and I don't really have any big plans for exactly where they're gonna go. So I just leave a, little, a few little spots in the borders so that when I've got the flowers germinated and ready to go out, there's a few little gaps for them. And I am, with these broad beans, so I do generally, generally think my, new, my soil isn't super rich, uh, just putting a little bit of feed in the hole. The roots on these look absolutely amazing and I've got a feeling that I've got the timing pretty close to perfect. They're just starting to show a little bit of discoloration, not quite yellowing of the leaves, but just a little bit of fading. And these, I'm just kind of gently pushing into these and they do seem to go in quite nicely. Maybe the holes, a little smaller than is ideal, but I think it's fine. Just a delicate push. I can feel that the, the roots are making contact with the soil and there's not a big gap at the bottom, which is the main thing, I think. And these are the uh, the Masterpiece Broad Bean from Grown Local. I'm really happy with these. And another thing, you know, I was saying about the germination earlier, another thing, pretty much 100%, well, 95% germination on these in the silver grow, so not an issue. and just a nice gentle watering in. It is quite unusual, despite the, the wet weather, the wet, 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 wet weather we've had. Um, the, the bed seems to have dried out. This was covered, but it was a, a permeable membrane, one of those soft ones. But I can see kind of cracking in the surface of the soil. Um, so I'm not sure if it's too happy, but I'll get a good mulch of horse manure on here very soon and that will definitely help things and it really helps to prevent the slugs as well. I love it, I love it, I love it so much. One of my favourite things about allotments is um, just little moments like now with the sun coming down and getting into the golden hour, the stuff you've just, I probably wouldn't experience if I wasn't out here in the garden and I love the garden obviously but just these little moments that you get, this I must say is one of the squiffiest lines I've done. <laughs> it's not, this one's okay, this one absolutely terrible. But thank you ever so much for joining me, folks. An extra special thank you to all of my Chili Pepper Tier patrons, Tony, Bill, Pam, Louise, Mel, Michael, Denise, Socks in the Garden, Andrew, Sarah, Angela, and Dorcas Or. Hopefully, I'll see you again in the next one, where there will be no more Dibber debate. Fingers crossed.